I want to take a moment to thank all of my patrons for being so awesome. You guys make this all possible. Thank you guys so much. Welcome to the Twisted Tentacle Inn. I'm your innkeeper, Vase Odin, and today we'll be talking about advanced action economy. In my intermediate action economy video, I deconstruct the common consensus that an action is worth more than a card, which is worth more than a resource. I touched on the fact that it's not always the case, and if you're looking to up your game, you'll quickly find that the true value of a card, a resource, and an action shifts as you play. Once you've gained experience playing the game, you realize that most of the time, your board state and other factors affect the actual value of a card and a resource. Sometimes it's worth more than an action, sometimes less. Rarely are they all about the same. Advanced action economy is not any given set of rules. Advanced players know that your gameplay should be fluid as the game is constantly changing throughout a scenario and certain moves can be more action efficient in one situation and less in another. I don't mean to be vague here, but if you'd like to know how advanced players do it, it's all about a constant analysis of the current state of the game. The best I can do to convey the concept of advanced action economy is to give you examples of specific situations and what an advanced mindset would look like in comparison to an intermediate mindset, along with tips from prominent members of the Arkham community. With these examples, you can hopefully begin to understand the mindset of an advanced player. All right, let's get started. First, a few definitions. Action economy. This is the general overarching concept of cards, abilities, and actions that gain results, which would normally take several actions to accomplish. Card advantage. The concept of having enough of the right cards to deal with situations that may cause you to lose momentum. Tempo can be positive or negative, specifically relates to whether a specific thing you do moves you forward toward a victory or doesn't immediately move you toward victory. Momentum, how ahead of the mythos you are, including how well prepared you are to deal with the bad things that are thrown at you. Momentum includes action economy, card advantage, and tempo. Good momentum usually results in victory. If you're confused, don't worry. I'm gonna clarify these terms throughout the video. If you're a casual player, the action card resource generic valuation is a decent rule to live by. But let's say you drew a treachery that gave you an option. Lose a random card from your hand or lose an action. General guidelines would say you always lose the card instead of the action. But there are times when a card or a resource may be worth more than an action. For example, say you have a shortcut in hand. You need to get to the next location to win the game but you currently have an enemy engaged with you and an attack from that enemy would defeat you. If you shortcut, you can win the game. If you don't play the card, you'll have to first fight the enemy and then use the move action. In this case, the card was worth more than any one action. Not losing shortcut in this situation gave you card advantage and using shortcut gave you positive tempo, propelling your momentum forward. To quote Metastrophic from the Metastrophic YouTube channel and Lola Hayes Connoisseur, Different situations ask you to focus fire on different things, and cards and resources let you do what needs to be done. So action compression comes down to getting more than three actions worth of things done as the situation demands. And one thing I should note in this quote, which a lot of Arkham players also do, is they call it action compression instead of action economy. It's just a matter of their personal preference and my personal preference. They mean the same thing in this case. Now, on the flip side, uh, a resource can be worth a lot less than an action. For example, say you have eight resources available and nothing to spend them on. Using an action to play a card like Emergency Cash to gain three resources, although it's considered to have good action economy, is probably not a strategically sound play as it did absolutely nothing to help you advance in the game. Unless you plan on using all those resources for a big move later on somehow you're literally wasting an action for zero benefit. This is what we call negative tempo, and a common mistake newer players make when they have a card like Emergency Cash in hand. And to quote JP from the Northern Lights Over Arkham YouTube channel, don't waste your whole first turn to play each asset you have if they're not necessary. Some really sound advice to live by. Only play assets that you absolutely know that you're gonna need uh, in the immediate future. If it can wait, let it wait. So, 
To go back to drawing a card being the equivalent of one action, it can be in a vacuum since it costs an action to draw a card. But if that card grants you card advantage, then the draw action gave you more momentum than a standard action. As another example, if you're investigating a six shroud location with two clues on it and have a five intellect, you'll likely spend several actions to succeed. Using a card to grant you a free action can help minimize that. But if you play a card that lets you search for, say, a drawn to the flame, then that card just saved you several actions. This is momentum. Drawing the card was negative tempo because the action of drawing the card did nothing to advance the game on its own. But spending an action to play Drawn to the Flame netted you two clues. So the initial negative tempo of searching for a card actually granted you momentum by helping you move your position in the game forward far beyond what would have been possible otherwise with just using the investigate action. Here's a tip from fellow great old one and friend of the channel, Nate, lost in time and space. One thing I'd point out is how to best use actions given to you. Spend some time planning out your turn before you commit to taking certain actions. While plenty of cards help you compress actions, knowing what actions you need to take will make your turns more efficient. Example, if you need to investigate a four shroud location, but don't have a way to boost your current intellect to six, then it's more effective to use actions to draw cards that help you reach that threshold. Sometimes, if you're playing blind, you can't necessarily plan your movement, especially in a campaign like The Forgotten Age. But once you've played a scenario, you can have a better idea of what to expect. Moving is a big action sink, especially in solo play. Wasting actions on unnecessary movement can be the difference between completing a scenario with a desirable outcome or failing to complete your objectives. Planning your movement ahead of time is a huge way to prevent negative tempo and helps you gain momentum. Let's take a look at this situation. Here we have six locations. Your starting location has no clues on it, and to exit, you need to move up to the location above, uh, but you need to have four clues in order to do that. There is a clue on the location to the left, and there are three additional locations towards the right. What is the best move here? Let me give you a little bit more context. Say you're playing Joe Diamond, and you have a lot of secret cards which require clues to be on a location in order for you to benefit from them. So what would you do here? In this case, here analyzing which investigator you're using, their abilities, their card pool, and which cards you have in hand will greatly determine which is the best course of action. Here Joe Diamond has Inquiring Mind in his hand, and this card requires there to be a clue at the location in order for you to commit the card for three wild icons. That's pretty powerful, but if there are no clues in your location, you're not gonna be able to use this card. So Joe Diamond's best course of action is to move two locations over to the right at the top and start grabbing the clues from there. Because should he get stuck at the location to the right, there'll be a clue there and he can commit his inquiring mind into that test. He can then move on to the location at the upper right and pick up that clue and then work his way backwards, grabbing clues on his way back. If you were to make the rookie mistake of grabbing the clues as you're passing through those locations with an investigator like Joe Diamond and a card like Inquiring Mind, well, you wouldn't be able to use Inquiring Mind as you're moving along or as you're moving backwards towards your final destination on the left. So planning your moves ahead of time is extremely important in order to maximize your turns and your actions. Health, sanity, and doom can also be resources to help you prevent negative tempo. Advanced players use these game elements and exploit them to their benefit. To drive this point home, check out this quote from Nate, Lost in Time and Space, quoting magic legend Patrick Champin. Tempo is the manipulation of any resource that you gain over time, but you do not start with. The key to understanding tempo is to evaluate everything in terms of how much this resource is worth right now. To take tempo away from your opponent is to give yourself tempo, but this matters not at all if you don't do anything with it. You don't need to draw extra cards to play a tempo strategy. You just need to capitalize on something that you're gaining from time. 
For example, you really need to advance the act, and to do so you need to clear the location next to your current location of clues. The problem is that you have an enemy engaged with you and it has 4 health. It deals 2 damage on a hit and you have 9 health. Depending on your current scenario and situation, you can just move, taking the attack of opportunity, and then investigate the location, taking another attack. You've taken 4 damage, but advanced the act this round, which probably would not have been possible for 1 or maybe 2 rounds if you had tried to fight with the enemy. As long as you're not defeated, your health and sanity values can be used to help tilt the game in your favor and avoid losing momentum. Think about it this way, the mythos tricks you into thinking that losing health and sanity is a loss of momentum. But most of the time, the opposite is true. By committing a card to a test in order to avoid sanity loss, you lost some card advantage. Worse, if you had to spend a resource to play, say, Ward of Protection to prevent a treachery from dealing too hard to you, this hurts your momentum. By using a card and a resource, you lost resources that could have helped your overall momentum. In the same example, if your current sanity value happened to be a 9, losing 2 sanity does nothing to hinder your momentum. Using a card and a resource does hinder your momentum. This is how an advanced player thinks. Now, I'm not saying never play Ward of Protection to prevent too hard damage, just that certain situations like the one I just described are the ones that separate an advanced player from an intermediate one. The same can be done with Doom. A lot of Mystic characters have cards that allow them to play around with adding Doom and then removing it later. Doom can be considered a resource because it, on its own it does nothing. Until you reach the Doom threshold itself, Doom is actually kind of pointless. So having one Doom on the table or eight Doom on the table, neither one means anything if the Doom threshold is 10 and you haven't reached it yet. So by playing Doom to your advantage, you can actually benefit from some cards that have extremely powerful abilities but happen to add Doom to the agenda. Now, this is something that I don't recommend for new players. You definitely want to be careful when playing around with Doom because it can quickly get out of hand and then you're stuck losing several turns because the Doom threshold had been reached due to your playing around with it. So definitely something to tread lightly with but something else to keep in mind. Analyzing the board state and thinking a few steps ahead is important to keep momentum. There are many things you can do that may seem minor at first, but making enough of these kind of decisions can really add up throughout a scenario. To quote a friend of the channel, Network57, if they're not playing blind, be aware of the scenario and the player count. In solo, certain scenarios, it's not worth saving that deduction. The action compression of the extra clue can be wasted if there's only one or two two clue locations even possible to find. Also, as I'm learning lately, evade can be action compression. Instead of wasting two to three actions to defeat an enemy, evade once and leave them behind. For some maps, you can stay one step ahead of them, like in Pallid Mask or Carnivale of Horrors, where hunters can't ever catch you if you're doing it right. So that's actually a really good point. If your investigator is good at evasion, it may be a more efficient play to evade an enemy rather than fight. Even a 20 health enemy can be evaded with one action, versus trying to kill it which may take many actions and even many rounds in order to accomplish. It is also important to consider your investigator abilities and different ways to use your cards. Friend of the channel Solar J sums this up pretty nicely. Inbuilt card draw, fast keyword, fast actions, movement abilities, testless outcomes, and additional actions, free resources, skill cards with any bonuses, fail to win cards. Advanced play on this is leveraging them all together, not just multiple cards but across investigators at the table, building synergy. Catalyst cards like Double or Nothing and even Teamwork hold potentially huge action compression with the right setting. I think that plays into the situation problem for actions. Just like a resource cost curve, there's also a rig complexity curve to consider. This is where your investigator relies on a critical mass of certain cards to start to function as intended, either in hand or on the table. Certain investigators really need their assets down or certain cards in hand before they function well. The more complex the rig, the more actions up front are needed to set up, draw up, play down before becoming effective, making this an important consideration for action efficiency. 
Some scenarios really tax a complex rig that is heavy with assets. The unspeakable oath is a classic counter to a complex rig with both a short clock and a particularly nasty asset hate card. Straight jacket. Making the time spent setting up even more action intensive than a scenario with just a short clock. This is why Ever Vigilant is so amazing for complex rig builds and fast assets for the same reason. Joy the Rat needs more respect in facilitating this type of play. Considering all that, a flexible deck build is not just about being a jack of all trades, but can instead be one that has a flexible or low rig complexity that can function okay with one of several key cards rather than going all in on a specific combo and hurting when they can't get you there. Another thing to consider is that making plays that provide negative tempo is not necessarily bad. It's important to understand the concept, but even more important to understand that negative tempo is going to happen and that it's okay to have negative tempo if it's going to provide an advantage later. To quote Mythos Buster Scott, drawing cards with preposterous sketches is not positive tempo. In fact, it's negative tempo. It is card advantage and you can leverage card advantage to get tempo, but drawing cards alone does nothing. But many people see more cards equals good, therefore drawing cards equals tempo. Tempo is also only one piece of it though. You need tempo to win, you need card advantage to win, you need resources to win. Like playing down a fingerprint kit alone is negative tempo, setup is negative tempo, but that fingerprint kit is going to pay out in tempo in the future. That's momentum. Tempo is a piece of momentum, they are not competing ideas. And as Matastrophic responds, similarly having a full hand with lots of icons can represent having greater momentum than an empty hand because you have the icons to bat away the obstacles that would slow you down. For example, let's say you've just drawn Frozen in Fear. You're a three willpower investigator. Having a guts in hand would mean you have more momentum than not having guts in hand. Because you'll lose one action to Frozen in Fear unavoidably, but then that gut helps you get rid of the frozen in fear so you can keep going. And Mythos Buster Scott elaborates. Playing an asset is negative tempo, but no one would argue that it is a negative thing to do overall. But play too many assets and may be too big of a tempo hit. So the point there is to be aware of how much time you're taking to set yourself up. If you just set up forever, you'll lose. So back to Magic player Patrick Champion's quote. How much a resource is worth right now? Instead of assigning flat values to such resources, it's the main idea behind advanced action economy. So how much something is worth right now, meaning health, sanity, actions, turns, resources, cards, anything that can help you gain tempo or momentum. What is it worth at the moment? And constantly analyzing that is exactly what advanced action economy is all about. Knowing that a card is not always worth less than an action and that a certain action is worth more in one case than the same action under different circumstances is how advanced players think. I do hope this video was helpful for you and if you have any questions or comments please feel free to leave them there. in the comments below. As always, I'm Innkeeper Vase Odin with the Twisted Tentacle Inn. Check in anytime. I'll talk to you then.